Northfield family. My name is Lindsay Matlock, and this is my husband, Seth, and our three youngest children, Gage, Sutton, and Eden. You may have seen us hanging out with your kids in the back on Sunday mornings or on Wednesday nights in the Student Center. Our mission here at Northfield is to love God, love people, and make Jesus known. No matter how you may be watching today, we want to say thank you for making us a part of your week. As you're watching today, we would love for you to check in at Northfield on Facebook or Instagram by using the hashtag Northfield at home. For the month of June, we're partnering with Plant With Purpose, and for every 10 check-ins, a tree will be planted. Also, we want to invite you to fill out our digital connection card. You can find it on the app under the home tab or on the website at northfieldchurch.net slash live underneath the live broadcast. On the connection card, you can submit prayer requests for our staff to pray over throughout the week, as well as make us aware of any needs in our community. And speaking of the app and the website, we wanted to remind you that virtual VBS starts tomorrow, and we are so excited to see how your families dive deeper into faith by putting focus on God and His amazing plan for us. Gage, Sutton, and Eden are going to help us kick our week off with a preschool memory verse. Go ahead, you ready? Let us keep looking to Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2. As you and your family focus on God this week, we encourage you to take a video saying this week's memory verse, whether it's preschool or elementary, and post it in the Northfield Kids Facebook page using the hashtag NFVBS2020. And as always, if you have any questions about this year's virtual VBS, we would love to help in any way that we can. If there's anything that we can do, please, please feel free to email us at kids at northfieldchurch.net. We're about to sing a song called Eye of the Storm. It goes like this. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. You may have felt like you were in a storm this past week. To borrow the words of Pastor Tom, let us allow our tears and let us allow our emotions to lead us toward action and make a reality out of one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. Sing with us today. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. And in the middle of the war, you got my soul. You alone are the anchor When my sails are torn Your love surrounds me In the eye of the storm When the solid ground is falling out From underneath my feet Between the black skies and my red eyes I can barely see When I realize I've been sold out my friends and my family I can feel the rain reminding me In the eye of the storm You remain in control Far from me, and I'm running out of faith. I see the future, our picture slowly fade away. And when the tears of pain and heartache are pouring down my face, will I find my peace in Jesus' name? In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. doctor says I've only got a few months left it's like a bitter pill I'm swallowing I can barely take a breath and when addiction steals my baby girl and there's nothing I can do my only hope is to trust you I trust 
trust you, Lord. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. You remain, Lord. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me. In the eye of the storm, in the eye, you remain in control. I find myself growing more and more in love with this moment and this meal. The table celebrates Jesus and the incredible work he did on the cross. The bread represents his body and the juice represents his blood. And I find myself loving it more and more because each week the meal grows larger to me and the moment more powerful. Because this meal and what Jesus did on the cross is all about the power of his love for us. The story of Hosea in the Old Testament explains this way better than I ever could. Hosea, a prophet of God, fell in love with a prostitute. God knew that that woman would cheat on Hosea and cause him so much hurt. But God also knew that the heart wants what the heart wants. So he told Hosea to marry her and that he would use their marriage to teach Hosea about God's love for him and for his people. So Hosea married her. And just like you might think, she cheated on Hosea and she left him for another man. Hosea had every right to start fresh with someone new. But like I said a moment ago, the heart wants what the heart wants. And love is a very powerful force. Instead of starting fresh with someone new, Hosea looked everywhere for his bride and he would not be satisfied until he had her back. He finally tracked her down and found her living as a prisoner to the very man that she left Hosea for. It seemed hopeless, but love is a powerful force and love finds a way. So as a man deeply in love with his wife, even though she had cheated on him, and even though she'd left him, Hosea found a way. Because his wife was now in chains to this other man, Hosea literally had to purchase her to get her back. He had to buy her out of the prison that she found herself in. Can you imagine the love that he had for his wife that even though she cheated on him and ran away from him, his love for her was so powerful that he was literally willing to do whatever it took to have her back. He ran after her. He looked everywhere for her and he purchased her back just to have his wife again. He literally helped her break every chain that kept them apart. That day, his wife was no longer a prisoner. She was no longer imprisoned by her actions. She had been liberated by love. That is what this meal is all about and why I love it so much. Our sin left us far from God. If you are like me, then you sometimes chase after sinful things, things that add no value to your life. Things that ultimately turn on you and imprison you. But God's love is a powerful force. The heart wants what the heart wants. And God's heart wants you. And God's heart wants me. The story of the cross is a story of God doing literally what He had to do to free us. He chased us down found us imprisoned to our own sin. And through the blood of Jesus, He brought us back. We have been liberated 
by love. I want to pray with you, and then I want to invite you to take communion with me. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. The fact that you sent your own son to take our punishment in our place. To help us break every chain that separates us from you. God, I don't know how to say thank you enough. I don't know the words to express the gratitude in my heart. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you for freeing us. It's through His holy and precious name we pray. Amen. As the song we are about to sing says, because of the cross there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Sing it, y'all. There is power.
I gotta say, this has not been the easiest of weeks. And you know what? I'm sad. I could be angry. And there are some that are telling me that I should be angry. But no, I'm just sad. I'm sad because my wife-to-be has a fear that I may not come home. Not because of who I am, not because of what my character consists of, but I might not come home because someone does not like the color of my skin. I'm sad because I have to have conversations with my daughters about this. And then they have bad dreams because of it. They wake me up in the middle of the night because they are scared and they if there's someone outside that's coming to get them, they're afraid. I'm sad because what I see from people that I know and care about and love is division. Division at a time where there needs to be more unity than ever. I'm sad because I became riddled with anxiety when I see a policeman behind me. And it's not because I've done anything wrong, but because I see what happens on the news. My experience is not unique in that if you talk to the average black person, we have a bit of hesitancy when it comes to the police. And that's sad because they are good and they have the best intentions of our community at heart. But put yourself in my shoes. Philandro Castile, George Floyd, Eric Garner, imperfect men that were taken away from this world due to police brutality. Are they coming for me next? I wonder what it would take for some people to understand. Doesn't mean that I have to die just so some people can get what everyone is talking about. I think there are quite a few people who know about me and who I am and what I stand for. But does it take me dying for them to, for them to get that this is a problem? I'm sad because I don't want to have to do this. I don't want to have to speak about this because I'm not too sure what everyone will think or understand where I'm coming from. There are probably people who even think that this is a political statement. But here's the wild thing. In the midst of all this, I, we, are called to love others. I, we, are called to give grace. And I have to do that. It would be absolutely easy to snap at someone who says something out of ignorance or anger or fear, and I can just blow up and feel so much better. However, I know I cannot do that. Why? Because of the one who lives inside of me. And I know that he is able to break every chain. He's able to, check to break the chains of racism, the chains of police brutality, the chains of division. Jesus is able to do all of that. Jesus is love and love conquers all. There's power in that. That's why I hang, what's what I hang on to in this crazy simple world. Jesus is more than able to do all of that and so much more if we give our lives over to him. So whoever you are, wherever you are, sing this with me. There is power. Jesus, I read your words. 
I read your words where you came into the synagogue and you said, For the Spirit of the Lord is on me. Because you have anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. You have sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind. To set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. Father, your words, your words, they inspire us as we read them. But they challenge us as a people to pick up your cause and to use our lives, Father, for your purpose. Father, I know and I believe that you care about us. And Father, as we just sang, we believe that your love is the only thing on earth that can break the chains, that can break the chains of adversity, that can break the chains of oppression, that can break the chains of racism, Father, that can break the chains of addictions. And Jesus, I see and I, and I ask that you teach us as people to love as you loved people and to treat people as you treated people. Father, I pray that we would be a people united and that we would do just exactly what you said we would do. That we would take your message of love into the hard places, into the Judeas and into the Samarias of our lives. Father, I pray that you would help us to be uncomfortable in our lives, to take and go out of our ways, Father, to spread your love to other people. Father, I pray that we would be willing to go into those hard places and bring light. Would you work through us and may your love, Father, break every chain. And may our message be that we, like Jesus, are here to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I ask it in the powerful name of the one who can break every chain in our lives. The name of Jesus. Amen. Well, hello, Northville family. What a powerful, powerful and emotional way to begin today. And I just want to thank you, Gooch. Just thank you. First, let me tell you how much I love each of you. Do you know how much of a privilege it is that I get to share a little bit of your time each week? And it's an honor to serve beside you in kingdom work. I know you've been praying for our nation over the past week and your response to our request to just start a conversation with someone whose skin may be a little different color than yours has been absolutely tremendous. I'm already hearing stories of healing and sharing and stories of reconciliation. For some of you, this is new. For others, well, you've been speaking out for a long time and our prayer is that your voices are being heard and our promise as a church is that we want to listen and that we care. I want to continue to ask you to pray, not only for our nation as a whole, but for individuals as well. I ask you to pray that God will open your eyes to see people as he sees people, to treat people as he would treat people, and to love people as he would love people. It isn't enough to just ask, what will we do? But I want you to ask, what can I do? And then do it. Go out of your way. Get uncomfortable. Move heaven and earth, as Jesus would say, to bring heaven to earth. And as his half-brother said, be doers of the word and not hearers only. You know, as a child and now as an adult, I love the song, This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine. Do you remember it? As little kids, well, we would hold up our fingers and we would sing at the top of our lungs, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. All around the neighborhood, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Could we do that? Could we let not the color of our skin, but the color of our blood remind us that we are all children of one God. And together, our little lights can become one bright light that can break every chain. For me, with this little light of mine, I've decided I'm going to let it shine. And I pray that you will too. You know, as we move on, I hope that you have all marked July 5th on your calendar. That is the date we are returning to in-person gatherings at Northville. Your staff is so excited and looking forward to seeing you and being together again. I want to give you some information today as we look forward to July 5th. Number one, most exciting, we are going to three services on that date. 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11. That is exciting to me. I hope it is for you as well. Because if you've been at Northfield for any length of time, you will know that we were already at capacity in our 9 a.m. service and almost at capacity in the 1030 service. And we were already going to lead off in September with three services. So coronavirus has just kicked this into high gear. And we are starting July 5th with three services. And this is where we need your help today. 
We need every family to go online and fill out a digital connection card. Did you hear that? Every family. You can get to that from the Northville app, the Northville website, or from the link that will be posted on our Facebook page. Since we will only have about half of the seats we normally have, and since children will be in the auditorium with us, it is extremely important for you to let us know if you're planning on coming back on that date, and if so, which service you plan on attending. That way we can do our best to be prepared with staff, space, and volunteers. So, on your digital connection card today, remember, only fill out one per family. Number two, let us know which service you plan on attending, either the 8, the 9.30, the 11, or if you're going to continue to worship with us online for now. And then number three, when you choose one of those times, a drop-down box will appear asking how many from your family will be returning. Please remember to fill that box in as well and include yourself in that number. I cannot express how important that information is going to be for us to create a welcoming environment. Some other exciting news is that over 200 of you volunteered to serve on that date, to which we say, woohoo! Some less exciting news is that we didn't require your name or contact information on that survey, so we're not sure who all of you are. So we apologize for that, and we're asking on this connection card that you're all filling out today, if you will volunteer with us in any capacity, please check that box. A drop-down will appear, and you'll have several opportunities from which you can choose. Or you can choose the box that just says, put me where I'm needed. I'm going to take an army, or <laughs> it's going to take an army, and we appreciate your help in being part of that army to make July 5th happen. And one last thing, you guys are already awesome at serving, and as we go to three services, it's going to take all of us. And I'm asking that you will adopt this slogan as we go forward as a church family. Sit one, serve one. Can I say it again? Sit one and serve one. And together, we can continue to make a difference in this community and in the lives of our church family. And now, I want to turn it over to our incredible student pastor, Trent Forrest, for part three of Own It. Trent, hey, uh, Father, uh, thank you. Uh, Father, I thank you, first of all, for giving me someone to work with for so many years uh, from way back when we were meeting in a school building and all the ups and downs and the hours that uh, this young man and I have spent planning and dreaming and thinking of days like this and, and what we would do. I, Father, I thank you for preparing us. But, Father, I thank you more than that for prefer, prefer, preparing him for this moment, for this opportunity. I thank you for the gifts that you put inside of him. And, Father, I thank you for what he means to so many of not only our kids, but the adults and for the kingdom of God as well. Father, uh, he is a young man who truly does live to bring a little bit of heaven to earth. I thank you for him. And I ask you to bless his words today, to make them your words. And I thank you for letting him be such a wonderful part of our incredible Northfield family. In Jesus' name, amen. Own it, brother. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Well, hey. Uh, thank you for the update, and we are all looking forward to seeing you in person on July the 5th at either 8, 9.30, or 11 a.m., so be sure to sign up on your connection card, and be sure to sign up to serve in some capacity as we resume our in-person gatherings. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we started a series called Own It, and we are taking a closer look at what it means to take responsibility for your life. And again, my name is Trent. I'm the student pastor here at Northfield, and I'm glad that you're joining us today. Even though you may have missed a couple of weeks, it doesn't mean that you won't get anything out of today's message because I believe that God has something in store for us. And I would encourage you to go back and either watch or listen to the first parts of this message so that you can be fully caught up for yourself. But since you probably don't want to push pause on this and pull up something different and go back, I understand. I'll give you a brief recap to bring you up to speed, and then we will jump in to today's message. Reminder number one is this, is that you were created to be responsible. You were created to be responsible. If you go all the way back into the beginning of Scripture in the book of Genesis, what you will find for Adam and Eve was not a list of rules that God gave them to follow. Rather, what you will find is a sense of responsibility for them to live up to. Which then brings us to reminder number two, that you are your happiest when you manage responsibilities well. You are your happiest when you manage your responsibilities well. Each of us has been given a purpose to fulfill in life. Guys, you know this feeling. 
It's that feeling when you've been sweating out in the yard all day and you just stand back, you put your hand on your hips and you just nod. You go, yep, that's feeling good. Some of y'all did that yesterday. You know what I'm talking about. It's that sense of pride that comes with accomplishing. But there's also another reminder here. And it's more of a word of warning that your irresponsibility will eventually become someone else's responsibility. And this again, it's a danger because when we choose to not be responsible for our lives, it could be something as simple as not taking out the trash that now somebody has to take out for you. Or as we will see today, it could be the mistakes of one that has an impact on an entire nation. And so no matter how big or how small your irresponsibility may be, your irresponsibility will eventually become someone else's responsibility. Now, last week we introduced a principle in this series that is at work in each of our lives. Whether we choose to adhere to it or not, this principle is running in the backgrounds of our lives. And if you want more context into this principle, again, go back and watch last week. But to just reintroduce this principle that we talked about, it was this that people reap what they sow. And we've seen this at work in our lives. We've seen this at work in other people's lives that no matter how we may have experienced it, we have seen this principle at work. And basically where you are right now is the culmination of the decisions you made yesterday. And additionally speaking, your tomorrow will be directly affected by the decisions you make today. But I would venture to say that some of you who may have been listening last week you may have had an issue with that statement. You may have had an issue with this principle. You understand how the principle works. However, this principle doesn't seem to be working in your favor the way that you thought it would. And in this, in part, this is what we're talking about today. Because there are individuals, there are even entire groups of people who feel like they have been sowing all the right seeds, but they feel like they are reaping the harvest of someone else's irresponsibility. And if that's you today, hold tight. We're gonna address why that is the case a little bit later because there are also two other groups that we'll be talking about today. The first is those who consider themselves to be very religious, those who who have a tendency to maybe hide behind their prayers and to try to mask their responsibilities with prayer. And you've probably come across this person, and just to be completely honest with you right now, I've been this person before, and so there's no judgment on my end if this is you as well. But I've been one of those people that instead of taking responsibility in my life, I've said something like, well, let me pray about it. Let me pray about it. When all the while, I actually had no intention on ever doing anything. We'll talk about that as well. The other group that we're talking about is those of you who may have some misguided compassion. And and this is what I mean by this. You have compassion on people and that is a great quality to have. And when you see someone act irresponsibly, instead of holding them accountable, you begin to conjure up reasons for that person as to why they aren't being responsible. And in the South, this is one of those moments where some of you ladies use the phrase, bless their heart. Well, just bless their heart. It's not his fault. He just had a rough start in life. Or he didn't really come from a good home life growing up. It's not his fault. And you, in your sense of maybe misguided compassion, you facilitate irresponsibility within this person instead of confronting irresponsibility, either because you may be afraid of their reaction or, like we said, you may have a small sense of this misguided compassion and you actually further enable their irresponsibility. So there it is, kind of, kind of three groups. And if you don't feel like you fit into either of those, I, please don't check out on me because I can assure you there's a giant applicable step for everyone today. So stay tuned with us. Today, we're gonna be in the book of Joshua. It's in Joshua chapter seven. Joshua is found in the Old Testament. If you just open your Bible from the front cover, it's gonna go Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. If you just like open the front page and just keep turning left, you'll find it. That's where we are gonna eventually land today. But before we just jump straight in, we're gonna have to look at a little bit of context into what is happening in the book of Joshua. You see, Joshua is a historical book. It details the story of God's chosen people, the Israelites. And Joshua, after he becomes the leader of the Israelite nation, 
after Moses' death, and you remember Moses, you might remember him. He's the Israelite baby who floated down the Nile River in a basket, who was ultimately adopted into Pharaoh's household, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt. He had the whole interaction with the burning bush. He ended up leading the, the Israelite people out of slavery, out of Egypt. We sang about them earlier in our service today. He led them towards the promised land. You might have heard of the promised land too. Well, after their wandering in the wilderness for over 40 years, Moses dies. And Joshua assumes his leadership role after the death of Moses. And all throughout the book of Joshua, we get a detailed look at the Israelites' ascension as a free nation, which is so fascinating to watch it unfold. And so Joshua, Joshua leads the people into the promised land of Canaan. But there was a problem. The promised land was already inhabited by other people groups and other cultures. But however, there's a dynamic that's at play here because God knew this was going to be the case. And we're gonna take a small detour down history lane. So you history buffs are gonna love this. You're gonna see some, some little glimpses into scripture of how God was at work. But in this, we're all gonna get a full view of God's sovereignty over the entire world. You see about 600 years before we pick up in this story of Joshua, God promised Abraham that he would be the father of, of a great nation. You might remember the song. We're, we're going all the way on memory lane. You know, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Anyway, well, that's another song for another day. God gives Abraham a glimpse into the future he had for the Israelite nation at the time that he first made his covenant with Abraham. There's a fascinating story. God takes Abraham outside in the dead of night and he says, look up, look up at the stars. Count them if you even can. And God says to Abraham, a promise that rings true. He said, count the stars because so shall your offspring be. And then God continues his promise directly connected to Joshua that we're gonna look at. This is in Genesis 15, 13. This is what he says. It says, then the Lord said to Abram, he said, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs. And they will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. He's talking about Egypt here. He's talking about this entire slavery story and this emancipation story from Egypt. But he goes on, he says, and I, I will bring judgment on the nation they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. And as for you, talking about Abraham, he says, as for you, you shall go back to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. He begins talking to Abraham and he says, look, the nation that your people are going to be enslaved by, he says, I will deal with them. But your people, they will be made free. And after this, he continues in verse 16. He says, and your descendants, they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And this is the verse this is the important verse, verse 16, because this is the hyperlink that we're looking at from Genesis to Joshua that connects these two moments. You see, God knew all along that the promised land would belong to the Israelite people. And God knew that the promised land would be inhabited by a different nation and a different people group. And this is the part of the story that at first hearing, it, it might be difficult to understand. Because on the surface, it might look like that Joshua was just on a holy mission to stamp out and to kill anybody that was in the way of God's plan. And that might make God look vengeful and make God look violent. But I'm telling you, that was not the case. You see, there were other dynamics at play here. First, it is the realization that God has an expectation of behavior for human beings. You see this from God's Genesis ideal at creation and you watch human beings just spiral into a self-seeking and violent path, starting with Cain and Abel, leading to a horrible man named Lamech in Genesis 4 who boasted about his violence. And then you see descendants after descendants after descendants who continue down this path of violence and destruction. So much so that there were entire people groups who acted so vile and so wickedly towards women and children that it was in no way, shape, or form even remotely close to what God desired for humanity. Their culture was so opposite of the ideal that God had in mind for men and for women that he thought it better that this type of culture no longer exist for the good of the world. In Genesis 15, 16, it gives us a glimpse into God's sovereignty, 
Because if we are to hold ourselves to the conviction that God is the universal creator and therefore the owner and operator of all lands on earth, then we must also submit that God is the universal judge to whom all people are accountable. And so for God to say in verse 16, oops, sorry, go back, one more, come back. Verse 16, he says, and your descendants, they shall come back here. This is the story that we're gonna pick up in Joshua in just a second. He says, they're going to come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. This verse right here tells us that God, God was giving the Amorite people a chance. God was giving them a chance to right their wrongs, but at some point, God was going to intervene. God was going to step in. So fast forward from Genesis 15, 16 to Joshua. God gives the order through Joshua for the Israelites in the first battle of Jericho to destroy the city, to take nothing from the destroyed city. And this was not God's way of just flexing his God muscles, you know? God, God could do whatever he wants, so he's just gonna kill. No, 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 no. That's not how he was working. This was God raising up a nation, raising up a people group, and ultimately an ideal that would eventually culminate in Jesus. But this people group, Their mission was to demonstrate to the world around them how God's people were to behave. And so when the Israelites came in, God specifically instructed his people. He said, do not be affiliated with these people groups, with these cultures in any way. Don't take any of them to be your wives. Don't take any spoils of war. Don't even take the livestock. This is the backdrop that we're up against leading into the battle of Jericho. And so here we go. If you remember, God commands the Israelite army to circle the walls of the city. And every day for a week, the army would circle the walls of the city. And then on the seventh day, they circled the city seven times. They blew a trumpet. Everyone shouted as loud as they could after being mocked and yelled at. They're never going to work. But on the seventh day, after the loud shout, the walls come tumbling down. But remember, no spoils of war. Destroy the city and move on. Now that we're all caught up, This is what we're about to see in Joshua 7. This is the glimpse at what happens when one within a party of two or one within a family unit or one within an organization or one within a community at large or one within a people group chooses to act irresponsibly. Joshua 7.1. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. The devoted things here are what they were to destroy in the city of Jericho. The people of Israel, they broke their faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan of the tribe of Judah took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. You see, no one knows this. Only Achan and and maybe Achan's family are those within his tent. But the story continues. Verse two, Joshua then sent men from Jericho off to Ai. He said, go up, spy out the land. And the men went up and they spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and they said to him, don't have all the people go, but let only about two or 3,000 go up to attack Ai. Do not make the whole army toil up there for there's just a few. This battle's easy. Joshua, we got this. So, About 3,000 men went up there from the people and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and they chased them before the gate and they struck them at the descent and the hearts of the Israelite people melted and became as water. Then, then you see Joshua's reaction to what just happened. Then you see Joshua's reaction where they just came from a battle where they won. It was easy, no problem. Now they go off on their own, and this is what happens. Joshua, he tore his clothes, and he fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. And Joshua and the elders of Israel put dust on their heads. They were in a a period of mourning. They were in a period of asking, God, what happened here? Where were you in this story? I I mean, we just experienced conquering in battle, and then uh, we go and face this enemy, and, and where are you, God? Where are you? Where have you been? And this is like us. This is like us. We see the victories from before and then we go off and we wonder, well, God, where were you this time? 
Where were you here? And you see Joshua begin to blame him in verse 7. He says, oh Lord God, why have you, God, why have you brought these people over the Jordan at all? Why did you lead us into the promised land if you were just going to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? We would have been content to dwell in the wilderness. We would have been content to dwell in the wilderness. God, look what you've done. Joshua continues, Lord, what can I say? What can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land, they're going to hear about this. God, they're going to know how we operate. They're going to know that this is how we feel. They're going to hear of this. They're going to surround us, and they're going to cut off our name from the earth. And then this is where Joshua really lays into God. And he says, and then what will you do for your great name? Saying, God, this is on you. This isn't on me. God, this one, this is on you. It's kind of an embarrassing moment for God in this, isn't it? Well, not quite. Because you see, God knew that there was something at play here. And God has a response to Joshua, just like any good father would. The Lord said to Joshua, he says, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Get up. This is is no time to be down on your face. Joshua, get up. Joshua, what are you doing? And I think if Joshua were to answer this question, honestly, he would say, well, I was kind of blaming you for all this because... This is kind of your fault. God says, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? And don't miss this next part. Verse 11, Israel has sinned. And see, for us, as we read the story, we go, well, no, they didn't. Israel didn't sin. If anybody sinned, it was Achan. Achan sinned. This is where we begin to justify and go, well, no, 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 no. That, that wasn't the case here. Israel didn't do anything wrong. It was one person, one person that did wrong. But God says, no, 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 listen to me. Israel has sinned, for they have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They, they, it was just one They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied. Stolen and lied. It was one per. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Verse 12. It says, therefore, that is why the Israelite people cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction, just like the items that they stole excuse me, not they, the items that one stole. And he said, and I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Remember, these were the things that God said for them to leave. They were strictly commanded not to take these items for themselves. And so God then has a commandment for Joshua. He says in verse 13, he says, get up, get up. Here we go again, get up. Consecrate the people, prepare the people, and say to them, Consecrate yourselves, prepare yourselves for tomorrow. For the Lord, the God of Israel, says, There are devoted things in your midst. There are things that you cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. And so, again, this is a glimpse at what happens when one within two or one within a family, or one within a company or an organization, or one within a community, or one within a nation, chooses to act irresponsibly, or in this case, act disobediently. One man makes a mistake. One man gives into temptation. One man takes a little gold and a little silver for himself, but the whole nation of Israel suffers. 36 men lose their lives and the confidence of the entire nation disappears all because of the actions of one. To which you and I might say, that's not really fair. God, I I mean, I understand going after Achan. I mean, he was the one who wronged you here. 
He was the one who stole for himself. Why not make Achan pay? Why does the whole nation have to suffer? And the answer, this is the nature of community. This is the nature of the relationship. When one person is irresponsible, not only does the individual reap what they have sown, but so does everyone else connected to them. They eventually reap what they have sown too. And from our perspective, this is not fair, but it is true. You see, your irresponsibility eventually becomes my irresponsibility. And when you go the extra mile to do all the right things, whether it's emotionally, financially, morally, relationally, this is the nature of irresponsibility. What you sow, I reap if I'm connected to you. Responsibility and irresponsibility is community driven because we are connected. This is not a solo act. And this is difficult. But this, this is why we must become very intolerant. And I know that's not a good word right now. But we must become intolerant of irresponsibility because irresponsibility is connected and it will impact each of us and it is contagious. And this is why we should begin to call out and to confront irresponsibility when we see it in real time. And this is where some of you get fired up and, and this is where like you Enneagram nines, you peacemakers, you're like, I just want to crawl in a hole right now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not wired this way. I, I am not one to call out confrontation. And then there's others of you that, that you get fired up because like you love confrontation and you are, are just in and some of you are totally out and you avoid it at all costs. But here is the message of the message. You can't be tolerant of irresponsibility because there is no win in this game. Not only does the irresponsible individual pay, but then everybody connected to them pays as well. And this is challenging. And this is where most of us might push back and go, well, I can't do that. I can't do that because we're called to love one another. But I would submit to you that I think sometimes one of the most loving things you can do for someone is to call out their irresponsibility as it happens. Or, or you may think, well, uh, I can't do that. I'm a Christian. But I think if we were to take a closer look at Jesus and his ability to confront others and what he knows is wrong for them, it's part of our calling. You see, this kind of confrontation is spiritual. And the best thing that you can do for an individual or maybe for an individual's sake and for your sake and for your community's sake and for your company's sake and for your country's sake is to refuse to put up with irresponsibility because irresponsibility is contagious. And we said it in week one, what gets rewarded gets repeated and we can no longer tolerate to reward irresponsibility. We need to own our slice of the pie. And we need to hold one another accountable to our responsibilities. And in the network of people which I am connected, am I tolerant of their irresponsibility? Am I, am I tolerant of the irresponsibility that is also connected to me before it becomes my responsibility? For your sake, for my sake, for our country's sake. And if you want to read the rest of the story, you can. It's in Joshua 7, but I'm, I'm going to give you the cliff notes. Joshua, he gets up from this prayer. I, I don't know. I don't even know if he says amen. God just says, you need to get up. You need to quit praying because now is the time for action. Okay, praying time was happening. It is not praying time anymore. It's time to act. It's time to quit hiding behind the prayers. It's time to quit blaming me. It's time to act. And so they do. They issue a search party throughout the entire camp. They find the gold. They find the silver in Achan's tent. They punish Achan to make an example out of him. They go out into the battle of Ai and they conquer the battle and they begin to move on from there. But let's make this applicable to us. First, let me talk to the first group of people. Are you hiding behind your prayers? Are you praying when you need to stand up and do something? Have you been praying about something for far too long and now it is time to take action? I'll give you two indicators that it's time to take action in your life. One is this, 
If God has already addressed it in his word, you don't need to pray about it anymore. If God has spoken, then it is time to get up off your knees and it is time to start owning your life. You see, you don't have to pray about being honest. You simply need to just be honest. You don't have to pray about having patience. You simply need to have more patience. You don't have to pray about certain morality issues like staying faithful to your spouse. It's already been addressed. You don't have to pray about how you love your neighbor because Jesus made it abundantly clear that now is the time to begin loving your neighbor. And there's a whole list. There's a whole list of things in which God has already spoken. And it is time to stop praying. And it is time to start doing. The second indicator is this, is if you are trying to pray your way out of something that you've behaved your way into, well, then it's time to do something. You may be one of those smooth talkers who thinks, I can get away with just about anything. I can talk my way out of this. I used to feel like I could do this. But let me tell you, you can't pray your way out of your actions. I'm not saying that you can't pray alongside your actions. That is good. But you need to take action. And if you have substituted taking responsibility for praying, well, then you're just an irresponsible person that prays. It doesn't make you a responsible person. And I want to clearly say this so I don't get misconstrued. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray, but prayer can become such a religious act that we deceive ourselves into thinking that because we prayed, that that now we have become closer to God and this alleviates us from having to take responsibility. And that is not the case. And if you've behaved your way into a certain place in life, well, maybe, just maybe, God's whisper to you today is the same one he had for Joshua. Get up. What are you doing on your face? Consecrate yourself, prepare yourself. Get up, take action. So has God already covered it? And are you trying to pray your way out of something you behaved your way into? Second group of people, are there irresponsible people in your network, in your community? Is there irresponsibility that needs to be dealt with, but you are too afraid to address it? This could be with your spouse. This could be with your family unit. This could be with your fraternity, your sorority. This could be with your team at work. Are there irresponsibilities that need to be dealt with, but you are afraid to address them because you're worried about how they will react? Do you make excuses for them? Are you compensating for their irresponsibility? If so, let me say this. I applaud you. I applaud you and your giant heart for people and for your ability to believe the best and to see the best in them. But I'm telling you, if that is you, you are in a lose-lose situation because you're not helping them, nor are you helping you. And I would encourage you to let your heart go to its fullest potential by loving them through the difficult conversation, the conversation that addresses the irresponsibilities to help that person to help your relationship, to help your team at work, to help our community, to help our nation heal, but ultimately grow. Now that third group of people, if you are someone that says, I don't really like this principle. I don't really like this whole reaping and sowing things because I feel like I'm reaping what someone else has sown. And the fact is, you probably are. And that's never gonna change while that person is still within your circle of friends or they're inside that network, then chances are nothing is gonna change unless you make the change to either remove that person from the position of influence that they have in your life or you take the necessary steps to engage them in the conversation to help both of you move forward. So what is it in your life? What do you need to do today? What do you need to get up off of your face and do? What do you need to do to respond to someone else's behavior? Especially those of us who claim to be Jesus followers. Because as Jesus followers, we can't shy away from this conversation. As Christians, 
we should be the most responsible people on the planet and we should be the people who are fearless in our willingness to confront irresponsibility, whether it's in our family, it's on our teams, or it's in our world because we are commanded to love one another and confronting that irresponsibility might just be the most loving thing you can do for someone at that point of their lives. Church, friends, it is time that we own our lives. It is time that we take responsibility. Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Let me pray for you. Father, I'm so thankful for your words. I'm so thankful that something written thousands of years ago, that historical events that that happened so far outside of our culture today are so applicable and speak directly to where we are right now. And God, I ask, I ask that, that, that you begin to stamp out any irresponsibility that we have in our lives, that you will speak to us today and you will tell us we need to get up and we need to prepare ourselves and we need to take action because it is in those steps. It is in those moments where we will become face to face with you. And I believe, and I know it to be true, that when we begin to own our lives, when we begin to take responsibility for our actions, that we will grow and that we will become more like your son, Jesus. And in that, we will continue to bring your rule in your reign, in your heaven, into earth. God, we love you. And today, we all stand up and prepare ourselves to take action. And it is in your son's name that we pray. Amen. You know, the beauty of it all is that we don't walk in this life alone. Whether you feel like you've been reaping someone else's harvest or you feel like you've sown and reaped your way into what feels like an insurmountable barrier between you and God, may this next song be a reminder that there's one right there in the trials with you and that your first step towards you has already been taken. We love you and I hope that you'll come back next week as we wrap up this series, Own It.
Thanks again for joining us today. We're excited to be back with you in person on July 5th, and we wanted to give you a quick reminder about our upcoming service times. Our new in-person meeting times will be 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11. We would love to hear from each family watching today to let us know which service you're planning to attend on July 5th. We ask that you submit one connection card per family, and there's a place for you to indicate which service you plan to attend. This will help us to create the best experience possible across all three services. And on that digital connection card, there's some new opportunities to serve when we resume live services. Our First Impressions team is expanding and we would love for you to join our mission of creating a welcoming atmosphere for those who come onto our campus each week. And just a reminder about Jimmy Sight study on Psalm 23 tonight at 6 p.m. You can watch that on our Facebook page or on our website. We also want to thank you for your generosity and giving each week. Because of this, we can continue to meet the needs of our church families and also the needs of our community. If you would like to give, there are three ways you can do that. Through our app, through our website at northfieldchurch.net slash give, or even by mail. We love you, church, and we're so grateful that you partner with us as we seek to love God, love people, and to make Jesus known. Have a great week.